Um, I just want to welcome you and welcome our presenter today. If you have attended some Caltrain trainings, you might be familiar with our presenter, Dr. Melissa Bernstein. She's presented before on some incredible topics like reflective practice, um, trauma 101, secondary traumatic stress. I can go on and on. But in her role at Rady Children's Hospital, Melissa Bernstein, or Dr. Melissa Bernstein, directs the Advancing Children's Trauma Informed Systems, known as ACTS and trauma-informed licensing teams, known as TILT initiatives. Her research centers around supporting systems in planning for, implementing, and sustaining trauma-informed change that aligns with best practice and science. So we want to say hello and welcome back. We're so excited to have you and um, looking forward to the great information you're going to provide today. Thanks so much, Jess. Um, hi, everyone. Um, like Jess said, I'm Melissa Bernstein. I'm really, really excited to be here with you all today talking about children, uh, children with problematic sexual behavior. Um, so like Jess said, um, I've been at Radio Children's Hospital for the past three-ish years working on trauma-informed care systems work. Um, but before that, I was at the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center as first a postdoctoral fellow and then as an assistant professor. Um, and it was there that I worked under Dr. Jane Solofsky, who is one of the premier researchers on problematic sexual behavior and the developer, one of the developers of problematic sexual behavior, CBT. Um, so I had the great opportunity to do individual and group therapy um, with kiddos with problematic, problematic sexual behavior and really learned so much about that population um, through that work. Um, I actually hadn't really learned much about this population in my prior graduate school training, and I think that's pretty typical, unfortunately, so I'm really glad we get to be talking about this today. Um, so Jess mentioned the uh, Q&A, which is great. Please feel free to drop your questions there. We should have some time at the end to answer some questions. Um, but I will be presenting quite a bit of information today in a short amount of time. So if you do have questions along the way, um, if you want to drop them in the chat too, I'll really try my best to, to answer those as well. Um, okay, just to let you all know, I have received permission as well to uh, present on this topic and use these slides um, from the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center group. Um, they are copyrighted, but the slides are um, offered to you today um, and will be shared. Okay, so let's start off by talking about some terminology. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to be talking specifically about children. Um, so when I say children, I'm talking about kiddos 12 years of age and younger. So we really want to think about the developmental context in which we're talking about um, problematic sexual behavior, because as we probably all know um, sexual development in children versus sexual development in adolescents is going to be very different and the problematic behavior is going to look different. So for this presentation, we'll really be focusing again on children, so 12 years of age and younger. So I've been kind of throwing around the term problematic sexual behavior. You might hear me use the word PSD, um, but I know there are other terms for kiddos who have problematic sexual behaviors. And I'm really interested to hear um, in the chat, if you could, are there any other terms that you've heard being used for these kiddos in your role? Um, maybe if you've read a report um, or these kids have come across your office, what are some other terms that are out there that we hear for kiddos with problematic sexual behavior? And again, if you can throw them up in the chat, that'd be great. Great, so we see um, sexually reactive, absolutely. I'm definitely gonna come back to that one. So sexually reactive, maladapted sexual behavior, sexual deviance, um, perpetrators, absolutely, you hear that a lot. Sex offenders, definitely, we hear that off, very often as well. Great. Um, fast, yeah, lots of slang words. Sexual deviance, absolutely. Great, I think you guys nailed a lot of them. Absolutely. So unfortunately, you know, I think children do continue to be referred to as predators, sex offenders, sexual deviants, many perpetrators, right? We hear this when they're referred to services or we hear this when we're reading about this population. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I promise I'll do most of the talking. But I wonder what we think 
the ramifications of using these terms might be of calling children perpetrators, sex offenders, sexual deviants. Yeah, there's a stigma. It's so negative. There's so much shame. There's, uh, I see a lot of shame here. The label is unhelpful. It might be socially isolating, right? So much negative stigma. And I'm glad um, someone mentioned legal consequence. I'll come back to that as well. A lot of pathologizing. So this is clearly hitting um, a chord with you all, um, as does it me as well. Um, people tend to think it can't change. There's so much ramifications. There's so much importance in the language that we use. Um, and so we're really using this term problematic sexual behavior purposefully. Um, you guys can keep putting them in. Um, I love really seeing these, absolutely. Um, all of those terms that you all mentioned, it really dehumanizes the child, right? Um, it also really lumps these kiddos into the categories of adolescents with illegal sexual behavior and adults with illegal sexual behavior. So we're talking about kids, we're talking about children, and these children are 12 and younger. Um, in the state of California, there's no legal ramifications for 12 years and younger. It will change when we start talking about 14 and up, but again, we're talking about children. So we want to separate it from the legal consequences of some adolescents with problematic sexual behavior and adults, right? We'll talk a lot today, too, about the difference between um, adult and adolescent illegal sexual um, behaviors and, ch and child sexual problematic sexual behavior because they really are so different. Um, one of the terms I heard was sexually reactive. I actually did an internship in a sexually reactive youth group. Um, so that term is definitely out there and definitely applied. Um, what that term applies is that this child has been sexually abused and it's now sexually reactive. So it implies a sexual abuse history. And one thing we'll talk about is that not all kids who have problematic sexual behavior have a sexual abuse history. So um, the term can be uh, used, it's just not a general term. So we just wanna be careful with that term. Okay, so I think we're all on the same page. We're using the term children with problematic sexual behavior. Um, it's developmentally sensitive. It really focuses on the behavior, not who the child is. And it separates that behavior from some of those delinquencies that we think about. All right. So let's get into just like a general definition. When we say problematic sexual behavior or PSB, how are we defining this? So one of the ways that it's defined is um, a child that has initiated behaviors that involve a sexual body part like genitals, anus, buttocks, and her breasts in a manner that is developmentally inappropriate and potentially harmful to themselves or others. So there's a lot here in this definition. And I'd love to break it down a little and talk about what these behaviors look like. But before we jump into that, I'd like to spend a little bit of time just talking about what does typical sexual development look like in children and what are typical sexual behaviors that we can expect to see in childhood. That way we can put some of the problematic sexual behaviors in a developmental context, right? And so I think while many parents wish it wasn't true, sexual development does begin in childhood. So let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, so we're just gonna go through this. Uh, we won't spend too much time on here, um, but let's start in infancy. So when we're thinking of kiddos zero to two, we see there's a natural curiosity about their body. Self-touch is happening in public, in private. There's no inhibition around nudity, right? We're moving into early childhood. We do see self-touch in, uh, in ages two to five. Um, in early childhood, this is different than masturbation. Here we're talking about things like um, self-soothing. So maybe if kids are upset, they might touch their private parts or to get attention, things like that. Um, not always for pleasure. We see that this may occur privately or in public. Um, kiddos might start to ask questions about sexuality or reproduction. They might be um, curious about adult body parts. They wanna go in the bathroom with their parents. Um, and there's a continued lack of inhibition around nudity which is uh, developmentally appropriate. When we start getting into middle childhood, here we start to see self-touch for pleasure, typically in private. And then we see in late childhood, we start to think of that as masturbation, which we see increases, which is normative for that age group. We also see an interest in relationships. There's a curiosity about adult bodies, um, maybe wanting to look at media, um, maybe wanting to see people undress, 
Um, and then again, that self-touch for pleasure that happens in private at this age. Um, so I already see a question. So thank you, Adriana, for putting that in the chat. So what about youth who have obsessive thoughts about sexual acts without the act? Where would that fall? So we're going to talk a little bit about when this becomes problematic and what makes it problematic. Um, and it's interesting to think about, we'll come back to this question. It's interesting to think about the thought rather than behavior. Um, but when we talk about problematic behaviors, I'll make sure to bring that back up. So again, this is just typical sexual behavior. Um, we want to dispel the myth that there is no sexual development in childhood, we know there is. And it's really helpful for caregivers, for ourselves, helping professionals to understand what we might expect to see so that we can start to think, is this outside of normative sexual development? Another area that's very normative in this age is sexual play. So sexual exploration in childhood in the form of play is very natural and healthy if it involves some specific components. So if that play is exploratory, again, thinking about this age group, these kids are naturally curious and they learn through exploration. So if the play is exploratory in nature, if it's spontaneous and intermittent, so it's happening naturally within the play, it's not planned ahead of time. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, so it's not the only play that they're engaging in, right? Um, there's mutual agreement between the two kiddos that are playing. Uh, no child is objecting to the behavior. The play happens between um, kiddos of similar ages, sizes, and developmental level, right? So we're not talking about a 12-year-old looking at a four-year-old's private parts, right? We're talking about similar ages. So six-year-olds mutually looking at each other kind of in an exploratory way. So we want to think about that. Um, and then we want to think about that the behavior is not accompanied by any anger, fear, or uncomfortable feelings in the kids. Okay. So we know a little bit about typical sexual development. Let's talk a little bit about some guidelines for determining if sexual behaviors are problematic in childhood. So there's kind of these three domains we can think about. So the first one is thinking about frequency. So how often is the behavior happening? So let's say for self-touch behavior, is it happening all day, every day? Are body parts being harmed because it's happening too often? They won't leave the room, right? If it's a really high frequency, it's a problem. And you can think about that from a non-problematic sexual behavior perspective. So thinking about, you know, if a kiddo steals a piece of gum once and never does it again, versus if a kid is starting to shoplift, right? We think about the frequency of the behavior when it becomes problematic, when we might need to intervene. So frequency is one area. Um, and then just to Adriana's point too, if it's obsessive, it's our, if our thoughts are obsessive, they're happening more frequently than they should, if they're interfering with the rest of our development and the rest of our activities, then that becomes problematic. And then we might wanna intervene. Um, so we also want to think, is this behavior that we're seeing, is it unresponsive to typical parent strategies? So maybe a child has um, started to touch their private parts not in private, and that's not appropriate. And we give them rules around what not to do. Um, we tell them why, we provide education around that. We've got good behavioral rules around it, and it's still happening. Uh, despite um, really good parenting strategies, then that might be problematic as well, right? So the second column we want to think about is some developmental considerations. So I think we, we mentioned this before with typical play, but again, we want to think about is the behavior happening around kids of similar chronological ages, so a six-year-old and a six-year-old, and developmental ages as well. So we want to think if a kiddo is 10, but developmentally four, then is it appropriate for them to engage in sexual exploration and play with another 10 year old? So we wanna think about developmental level and chronological age as well. Um, is it lasting longer in duration? Again, so are we spending all day doing using self-touch to the detriment of engaging in sports and other activities? Um, that would be problematic. Um, and if it interferes with social development, right? If their kids don't wanna go out, don't wanna engage with other kids, um, if they have negative feelings about that and there's shame, all of these things you want to take into consideration. And the last um, piece is the idea of harm, right? So if the behaviors are intrusive, 
Um, we'll talk on the next slide a little bit about what are intrusive sexual behaviors in childhood, what are the rare sexual behaviors that we shouldn't, we would not expect to see. Um, so things like insertion, penetration. If there's any force involved in the sexual play or sexual behavior, if there's intimidation or coercion, um, then that's problematic. Um, and if it elicits anxiety or those other harmful feelings in kids, then it can be problematic as well. So again, it's, it's, there's a lot to consider here. There are a lot of factors. Um, it's not always black and white. In fact, it can get kind of confusing sometimes. So again, I think having this chart can be helpful for our own understanding of, of what might be concerning or problematic and when we might think intervention might be needed. Um, versus what might be more normative. Um, it's also helpful, I think, for caregivers to understand why um, and how the behavior is concerning or problematic. Again, we'll talk about caregivers in a little later. Um, they'll have a lot of different reactions to problematic sexual behavior in their kiddos. Okay, so I mentioned intrusive sexual behaviors or rare sexual behaviors. Um, this list was um, gathered after um, a study that was conducted using the Child Sexual Behavior Inventory, or CSBI. And these were reports typically from mothers. Um, and what we see here are these sexual acts that would not normally be known to children. Again, kid, we're talking about kiddos 12 years and younger. Um, so this list here you see is not typically known for kiddos. And there is a caveat that I will talk about. Um, but touching on their children's private parts after being told no and after having those good behavior rules in place, um, plans how to touch another child. So knowing that, okay, during this moment, this child's going to be alone, so I'm going to try and play with them then, right? That's problematic. Forcing anyone to engage in sexual acts. Um, insertion at this age um, is not known, not typically known. So um, uh, penetration or inserting fingers, anything like that. Um, puts mouth on sex parts is also not known, um, or trying to have sexual intercourse with a child or an adult. So these are rare sexual behaviors that we would not expect children to know. The caveat here is too that we do need to think about technology and the role that technology plays in what children are exposed to. It's a complicated issue um, and there is some really interesting research being done on the role of technology um, and what, what is normative. But from the research that we do have, we would consider these to be rare sexual behaviors. Okay. Um, so I see here in the question and answer, can you please provide another example of sexual play? So um, kids play doctors a lot, right? Maybe the, you walk in and all of a sudden, uh, the kids have their shirt off or their pants down and there's a stethoscope and they're kind of just kind of playing doctor, right? That might be, that's normative, right? That would be kind of sexual, sexual play. So a lot of acting out adult scenarios in, for kiddos um, that we see as kind of typical or, or normative um, sexual exploration. Um, if kids look at other kids' private parts um, or they're running around naked together, right? This is kind of what we can would consider like exploration and play. Sometimes we might not know what's happening when you open the door and you see two kiddos there without their pants on um, and there's private parts exposed. Um, and so it's it does involve sometimes asking some questions about for those kiddos about you know what was going on, what were you guys doing? Um, again, noticing how often that play is happening. Um, so there will be some sort of questions that we might want to follow up. Um, but typically when we're thinking about that, it's kids acting out kind of those adult behaviors in a playful, exploratory way. So if that answered that, that question. Okay, so I want to start talking a little bit about some of the characteristics, what we can expect, who are these kids with problematic sexual behavior. Um, so our first poll, I'm going to try my best to launch it myself. Okay, let's see. Great. So the majority of children with PSB are male. Again, we're thinking about, um, I'll just stop there. I'll let you guys answer. We've got the, the answers rolling in. Thank you guys for participating in this. Again, I just made it a true false. 
Um, and while you guys are still answering, I see Kevin has a question uh, or a statement maybe. I've had sexualized dancing. Um, okay, described as sexualized but media exposure. So I'm not exactly sure, Kevin. Um, so I'll just try and take a stab at that. Um, but um, again, when we're thinking of uh, kiddos, so maybe adolescents, it's different if there's media involved, if they're sharing some uh, the sexualized dancing with others, that would be problematic. Um, in children, if they're dancing in kind of a sexualized way because they saw that on the media, um, in the privacy of their home. Again, this is where it can get a little gray. It's up to parents, what's acceptable, what's not. Um, but again, dancing without harm, without harming anyone else in a private manner, um, that's not happening all the time. We wouldn't consider that problematic. Uh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the terms of thinking about is the behavior problematic, does it need intervention? I think I would say no to that for dancing. Again, they're not showing body parts in public if it's not meant to be, right, if we are. Um, dancing explicitly with our clothes off in public and we're in middle childhood and that would be problematic. But if it's with their friends in the home, um, then thinking about um, problematic sexual behavior that would need intervention, I would say no to that. Great. Okay, we've got 70% of folks that answered, so I'll take it. We're going to end the poll. Um, let's share the results. So we've got 31% of folks saying that is true. Um, and about 69% saying false. Okay, so the answer is false, but it also depends. Um, so again, when we're thinking about problematic sexual behavior in preschoolers, we actually tend to see more girls with problematic sexual behavior. That's what the research tells us. Um, in school age kids, we tend to see a 50-50 split. So it's about 50-50 uh, girls and boys. Um, again, these are that are entering into treatment that we know of. Um, in adolescents, it's predominantly boys, um, whereas girls tend to present with more risky sexual behavior, but adolescents is a whole other can of worms and a whole other training. Um, so when, again, kind of dispelling the myth that problematic sexual behavior, when we think of it, we think maybe it's only happening for boys, but in fact, again, in preschool age, typically um, more predominant in girls, and then it's about equal uh, in boys and girls in childhood. Okay, so some other characteristics, again, thinking about who are these kiddos um, with problematic sexual behavior. Um, one thing we do see is um, some relationship challenges, relationship issues. So about a, a quarter, I would say, of children with problematic sexual behavior have poor peer relationships, might be socially awkward. Um, we see some families that are very isolated, um, might not have um, exposure to healthy social peer interactions. Um, we also see that these kiddos are more likely to present with some other psychological problems or difficulties. So oftentimes there might be um, things like disruptive behavior disorders like ADHD, ODD, conduct disorder. Um, we sometimes see some trauma-related disorders like PTSD or adjustment dis uh, difficulties. Again, thinking back to that sexually reactive youth population. Um, in preschool children, we tend to see more separation anxiety, um, whereas in school-age kiddos, we tend to see um, depression. Um, and we also see some learning and language delays. Maybe about a third of kiddos um, don't have those adaptive skills, um, those, those uh, typical developmental skills due to some delays and some deficits. So these are some characteristics that we see in kiddos with uh, problematic sexual behavior. Okay. Um, so I wanna talk about um, factors that increase the likelihood that these kiddos would develop problematic sexual behavior. So I'm going to throw out a question to you. Um, we'll see how it goes. If not, I've got the answer ready. But when you hear children that have engaged in problematic sexual behavior, what's the first reason that comes to mind? So again, you hear a child, you see a child, a report comes to your desk that they've engaged in some problematic sexual behavior. What's one of the first thoughts that you have? Okay. <laughs> So we see here, um, the majority I see is sexual abuse um, by far. Um, we see uh, some trauma here as well, um, but flying in the chat, we see a ton of uh, sexual abuse. And absolutely, I think that's the first thing that people 
think about that if this child knows these behaviors, if they're behaving in a, in a non developmental way, if they're engaging in some problematic sexual behavior, then they've been sexually abused. Um, so I really want to dive into that and, and check out if this is the case or not. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share a couple uh, quick studies with you all um, to kind of dive into this idea of the relationship between sexual abuse and problematic sexual behavior. Um, so we're going to start with school age kiddos. So if we start with this um, pie chart on the left, there's a study done by Kendall and Tackett um, that looked at, uh, it was a meta-analysis, where they looked at a sample of kiddos who had been sexually abused. They found that only 6% had problematic sexual behavior. So we look at kids who have a sexual abuse history, the majority of them do not go on to have problematic sexual behavior, right? So then let's look at um, another study that looked at kids with problematic sexual behavior. Do they go on or have they had, excuse me, a sexual abuse history? So of those kids with problematic sexual behavior, in this first study, we see that 50% of them did have a sexual, sexual abuse history, but 50% did not. Um, we have another study here that shows a little higher rate, about 84% of kids with PSD had a sexual abuse history, but again, we're not at 100. So the data is a little mixed here. It really depends on how we define problematic sexual behavior and how we, uh, like what the sample size is. Um, but what we see here is that in no way is it 100% of kids who have problematic sexual behavior have been sexually abused. And in some studies, half of them have not, right? So we're really trying to think about um, while problematic sexual behavior might be a red flag for us, if you do come across a kiddo in your line of work that does have problematic sexual behavior, maybe screening for sexual abuse um, would be appropriate and make sense, right? It could be a red flag, but we don't want to assume that all kids with PSD have been sexually abused. Um, if we look at preschool children, we see somewhat similar results here as well. Um, so for kids, um, who have been sexually abused, who go on or have problematic sexual behavior, 67% do not. Um, and then we see similar results um, for those with PSD who had a sexual abuse history, we see it's about 50-50. Again, really trying to kind of break down that stereotype that all kids with PSD have a sexual abuse history. So I see some other um, um, explanations in the chat here for why uh, kiddos might go on to develop P PSB, and so we'll talk about those now. Um, I really like this slide. I think it's pretty comprehensive. Um, when we think about who goes on to develop PSB or problematic sexual behaviors, there are some vulnerabilities that we can look at. Um, so one cluster of vulnerabilities is this modeling of sexuality, um, which I think folks mentioned in the chat. Um, and so we've talked about sexual abuse as one vulnerability are also um, growing up in homes where there are um, inappropriate sexual behavior happening and being modeled, um, where there's, um, again, this modeling of inappropriate sexual behavior, but there may not be actual sexual abuse happening. Um, more likely though, what we tend to see is that modeling, modeling of coercion. Um, so this second cluster here. Um, so we might see lots of domestic violence in the house, right? Seeing hurt being modeled, knowing that it's okay to be maybe aggressive, or to hurt, to get what you want. Um, really thinking about how these kiddos, how the world around them deals with conflict and high levels of emotion, um, right? And so how do we uh, deal with those emotions? How do we deal um, with needing to get what we want, what's being modeled for us? A third kind of cluster, if you will, here is family adversity. And so this category is really anything that takes away from supervision. Right. So if a caregiver has to work three jobs and is out of the house a lot trying to care for their family, um, what we tend to see is it's the lack of supervision um, in the home where we tend to see maybe some of them more problematic sexual behavior. Um, if caregivers suffering from depression or substance use, um, again, these things take away from supervision. Um, and then when kids don't have supervision, they break rules. Right. And problematic sexual behavior is really a breaking of sexual behavior rules, right? And then this fourth cluster is thinking about child vulnerability. So we talked a little bit about that. We talked a little bit about kid, kiddos having their own trauma, maybe having those behavior problems, having that high level of impulsivity, maybe having some developmentally de uh, delays, not really knowing what's appropriate. 
Um, right, some kids just break a lot of rules and, and this is one that they break. Um, so thinking about all of these as kind of vulnerabilities for why kids go on to develop problematic sexual behavior. There's really no one size fits all. There's no kind of one specific pattern that if this happens, this happens, this happens, this kiddo is gonna have problematic sexual behavior. Um, it's really unique for each, for each child, for each family. Um, and so it's important to take into consideration all of these uh, variables, including sexual abuse, but not excluding all of the other ones as well. Okay, so how is um, this behavior maintained over time? Um, I really want to talk about this first line here. Um, so I think when, you know, when we first started uh, our time together today, and I asked you all, what are some other terms that you've heard used? Um, right, sex offender, deviant, perpetrator. I think what comes to mind for a lot of folks is a deviant sexual arousal, right? Because when we're talking about adults who engage in illegal behaviors with kiddos, we're thinking about a deviant sexual arousal. Um, and a, a really strong point I would like to make is that we rarely, rarely see a deviant sexual arousal in children. This behavior is happening for a lot of different reasons. Um, curiosity, attention seeking, self soothing, defiance, impulsivity, um, maybe preoccupations, maybe they have re experiencing symptoms, but very rarely is there a deviant sexual arousal to children. Um, and so I think this is what really um, helps in people's minds to separate that we're talking about children. We're not just talking about many adults. We can't just take what we know about sexual behavior in adulthood um, and apply it to children. Right, it's not going to work the same. And while we're not talking about adolescents in this presentation, it's also quite rare in adolescents as well, which I think is surprising to a lot of folks. Um, okay. So of course, um, we want to talk about supportive and protective factors um, because there are. And um, these, I think, are just general um, supportive and protective factors for a lot of different negative outcomes for kiddos, um, but also for problematic sexual behavior. Um, so things like healthy boundaries, um, having healthy boundaries modeled and supported in the home, um, protection from harm and trauma, um, parental guidance and supervision, we know that's a huge one. A lot of times, um, if a kiddo is engaging in problematic sexual behavior um, and a, kiddo, a parent or caregiver puts a rule in place um, that actually we only touch our private parts in private, we don't touch our private parts in public. And this is a rule and it's reinforced and it's a rule just like, you know, taking out the trash and other rules. Um, kiddos are usually really good at following that. Um, so that's kind of an, an idea. And when there's supervision there, a parent can help put that in place and help get that kiddo back on track. Healthy friendships, you know, social interaction and positive social interaction is so important. Um, open communication about feelings so that kids don't have to feel ashamed and hide some behavior, um, having successful social skills, and having those adaptive positive coping skills as well. Um, okay, one more thing I'll say about this too. Um, it's really helpful to talk about this with caregivers as well. I'll talk a little about, bit about caregivers' reaction, but oftentimes um, it can feel like there's no hope um, for these kiddos, which is not the case. Um, and so we do want to talk about whether our, our vulnerabilities are also a ton of supportive and protective factors. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about treatment outcomes. Now, I'm not sure um, for folks on the call, um, for folks on this webinar, if you are engaging in treatment with these kiddos, but even if you're not, um, I think it's really important for us as health and professionals to understand what treatments are out there, um, if treatments are successful, if they're helpful or not, um, and also what are the effective components of treatments that we can help support caregivers and families in accessing the best treatments that they can. Okay, so when we think about reactions that caregivers might have after hearing that their child has acted out sexually with another child, what do you think some reactions that caregivers might have? What might be some of these reactions? Fear, panic, maybe some shame, anger, absolutely sh shock, guilt, maybe some self-blame. So maybe this, is, maybe this is my fault, maybe I did something wrong. 
um, feeling frustrated, absolutely. Um, feeling really protected, protective, um, right? Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen to my kiddo. Um, I wanna protect my child, I wanna protect my family. Uh, maybe they have their own trauma triggers, right? Maybe they have their own uh, trauma history and it's bringing up stuff for them. Um, questioning things. Um, for foster parents, they worry kids are going to perpetrate on their own kids. Absolutely, and I'm really glad you brought that up. We'll talk a lot about, uh, we'll talk a lot about this as well. Um, there's a fear that um, if there is problematic sexual behavior in the past, there's gonna be continued problematic sexual behavior. And can these kiddos live with other kids? Is that gonna be safe? Um, there's a lot of questions happening, a lot of confusion. Absolutely. I think you guys um, really listed them all here. It's really quite an emotional roller coaster for caregivers when they hear that there's been sexually acting out. So I think you guys touched on most of these feelings of disbelief. Um, we also see a lot of not hope for the future that my kiddo has engaged in this behavior and there's no nothing we can do. There's no help. Um, that we can get. There's just kind of on this kind of negative path of delinquency, which we know isn't true. Um, they might not understand the seriousness of the situation. Um, you all brought up that it might impact their own trauma experiences or histories. And we also might see some divide, divided loyalties. So um, one thing I, I didn't mention, um, but what problematic sexual behavior also isn't is incest. So if we're thinking about kiddos, who are engaging in problematic sexual behavior with their sibling. So they're going into their sibling's room and touching those, touching their private parts, let's say engaging in any of those rare sexual behaviors, or the sibling has said, you know, I don't like this, this makes me feel uncomfortable and it continues to happen, right? So again, these kind of problematic sexual behaviors. If it's happening between siblings, we don't consider it to be incest because kiddos don't really know that this is taboo. Kids break behaviors, um, break rules, I should say, with kids that they have access to, so their siblings. So we do see a lot of problematic sexual behavior between siblings because that's who they have access to, right? Um, so what we might see for caregivers is some divided loyalties, right? So we have a, one kiddo who has engaged in problematic sexual behavior and then one kiddo who had that happen to them, right? And so that can be really, really tough for families to deal with. Okay, so what can we do? Is there therapy treatment for kiddos with problematic sexual behavior? Um, I want to highlight this one study um, that followed 135 kiddos from ages 5 to 12. Um, they followed kids from the original randomized controlled trial done looking at kids with problematic sexual behavior and looked at official records 10 years later. So this is a 10 year follow up study. Um, so what they did was look at rates of future juvenile and adult arrests, and they looked at child welfare um, perpetration reports. And what they found was that 98% of kiddos who went through cognitive behavior therapy um, for problematic sexual behavior had, um, did not have future problematic sexual behavior based on all of these reports. So it's a really, really small percentage that go on to have recidivism, right? And they looked very, very similar to the comparison group. Um, so the success of treatment is, is quite high if we think about um, future problematic sexual behavior. So again, these kiddos are not growing up to be adolescent sex offenders. That's not what we're seeing for the majority of kids. Okay, when we're talking about treatments, um, there is um, different kinds of treatments out there. I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by cognitive behavior therapy for problematic sexual behavior, um, but we see a really high success rate too. Um, and what we saw in this study um, was, again, looking at that 10-year follow-up data, was a little bit higher rate of um, success for the CBT group versus the uh, dynamic play therapy, but we see pretty great results across both. Um, what is the intervention for the comparison group? Great question. Let me go back to that. Here, okay, great. So it was just a general clinical comparison. So there were three groups here in this study. They looked at cognitive behavior therapy for problematic sexual behavior. They looked at dynamic play therapy, and they looked at just a general cl clinical comparison group. Um, so kids without PSD. And so you see here, they look quite similar to the general population. It's a great question. <clears throat> 
Okay, so I know we're not talking about adolescents, but I do want to share this slide because I just think it's so important to start to dispel the myths that these youth are the same as adults. So again, this was an adolescent population, so we're going to shift our mindset a little bit here. But there was a meta-analysis done pretty recently, um, included about 33,000 youth, 106 studies, and what they found was that the mean five-year sexual recidivism rate for offenses committed over the last 30 years was less than 5%. And if they take the most recent studies, so since 2000, we see that recidivism rate as 2.75%. Um, and what we see too is the longer one remains offense-free in the community, the lower the risk for sexual offending. I think this is one of the greatest fears that caregivers come into our doors with, that, okay, my child is, engage is engaging in this problematic sexual behavior, or first, is this behavior problematic? And then once we determine, yeah, this is actually problematic, there's harm involved, um, we wouldn't expect this behavior of a kiddo that age, um, it's happening too frequently, right? All those things we think about when we looked at that chart. Um, I think a lot of caregivers come in and think there's no hope, first of all, which we, you know, we talked about, but also my kid's going to end up in juvenile detention, my kid's going to end up an adult sex offender. And what we really, really can say is that the likelihood of that happening is very small. Right, and that we have really good treatment available. Um, so um, there's a question here, what's the age range for adolescents? It's a good question. Um, so I haven't presented on adolescents in a while, um, but when we're talking about adolescents, um, at least the way I'm thinking about it, um, we're talking about adolescents with illegal sexual behavior. Again, um, in California, that's 14 years and older. So probably um, 14 to 18. Um, and then the rules change again once they're of a different age. So it really depends, but um, adolescents typically, I'm thinking between 14, 13, just kind of preteen to about 18. Okay, um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about the characteristics of evidence-based treatments for youth with problematic sexual behavior. Again, even if we're not providing these treatments, it's helpful to know if a family is talking about what treatment they're receiving and if they're saying nothing's really working. It's helpful, I think, for us to know what are some of the core components that make treatment effective for this population. Um, so the first one is probably not surprising to anyone on this call, um, but that it directly involves caregivers. So when we're thinking about any evidence-based practice for young children, it's gonna involve caregivers, right? So the same thing for kids with problematic sexual behavior is um, there a behavioral parenting training component that's really important. Um, so our parents learning how to create rules, how to create rules around, uh, around private parts, around sexual behavior. Um, are they receiving sex education so they understand what's normative and, and what's not? Um, and is there abuse prevention for kids involved? Um, we also want to think about an intervention or a treatment that plans for safety um, prevention and for preventing future PSB. Um, and are there pieces of this intervention where there's kind of pro-social skills being taught as well? Because we know that's vulnerability. Um, so we always want to reinforce healthy pro-social activities. So oftentimes we'll hear caregivers taking away things like sports um, or karate or uh, about dance or organized kind of structured group activities with rules in them where there's a clear kind of supervisor. Um, and we have to be careful, right? We want to make sure um, that the sexual behavior we're talking about is not overly aggressive, that it can be responsive to discipline. And if it can, it's okay for these kiddos to continue to be in pro-social activities where there's good supervision. Right, we don't want to take these kids and isolate them. Um, that's really more leading them on track towards delinquency. We want those positive peer social interactions to happen. Youth that do have a deviant sexual arousal, and again, this is something more into adolescence as well, um, do require some specialized individual treatment, um, but we don't have any evidence-based practices for those kiddos at this point. So one thing that I think is really cool is something that the University of Oklahoma um, worked on in the groups that they run for kids, um, again, thinking of school-age kiddos with problematic sexual behaviors, asking the caregivers and the youth what they wanted. What would be important for us as helping professionals to know, 
Um, and so these are some things that they shared. So don't judge me and my child. Um, don't judge our family, right? If um, families are coming in and they feel judged um, because of what's happened, right? They're not going to uh, feel connected. They're not going to seek treatment. Um, problematic sexual behavior does not define my child. It's not who they are. They're more than um, just this, this thing that they've engaged in. Um, give me some reassurance and hope that there's things I can do, that there's treatments out there. Um, of course, we hope this for everything, but reduce my time from discovering the behavior to getting into treatment. Um, some um, additional voices of caregivers is tell me what to expect out of treatment. Um, be patient with me when I don't understand why I'm here. So a lot of times what we do see is, you know, all of the things you guys shared in the chat about how overwhelming it can be when caregivers learn that their child sexually acted out. They may not understand why they need to be involved in, in treatment, um, but really on, over time, what we do find is that if there's not that judgment, if there's that joining with caregiver, if we let them know you're not to blame, we're glad you're here, we can provide resources for you that they, they can really get back on track. Okay, so we'll definitely have some time for questions and answers, um, but I do wanna kinda get ahead of that a little by answering some common questions that we hear about children with problematic sexual behavior. So can children with problematic sexual behavior live with other children? Um, I know someone before um, talked about maybe the fear of having a uh, foster child in a home who has problematic sexual behavior, can they live with other kiddos? So research hasn't really dove deep into this issue to date, but I think what clinical experience would indicate is that for the most part, many children can remain in the home um, or a foster home with other children um, if they do have a history of problematic sexual behavior and if they're in treatment for problematic sexual behavior, right? If the behavior is highly aggressive, if the sexual behavior that um, is being reported is highly aggressive and intrusive, and there's been treatment and they have not been responsive to it, or if there's not close supervision in the home, then, then that would be an issue, right? Then we would think maybe not. But we wanna ask ourselves those questions. Do the caregivers have the parental capacity to provide supervision and safety, right? We don't want kids to be left alone in a room um, if we know there's, there's a history of problematic sexual behavior. Can we have that constant supervision? Does the child with PSB respond to supervision and do, can they respond to that guidance? Um, will they follow some um, sexual behavior rules if they're in place in the home? Um, and we also wanna think about the other kiddos in the home. So there's a lot to think about here. Um, are there kids with developmental delays that might be more at risk? Um, for being kind of uh, at the other end of problematic sexual behavior. But again, I think the biggest um, thing to think about is that supervision piece. Is there enough adequate supervision um, to have kind of eyes on? And are they responsive to following those uh, problematic sexual behavior rules um, and in treatment? Um, so the next question we get a lot is, do, do kiddos with PSD need intensive residential treatment? So I will say that most children with problematic sexual behavior can be treated while living at home or in the community. Um, residential and inpatient treatment should really be reserved for the severe cases. Again, um, maybe kiddos with comorbid psychiatric disorders, um, kids, again, with that highly aggressive sexualized behaviors, which reoccurs despite, despite outpatient treatment. So that's really what we're talking about here when we're thinking about um, needing kids to live outside the home. And then hopefully we can all answer this question together at this point. Will children with problematic sexual behavior grow up to be adult sexual offenders? Uh, majority is no. These are kiddos. They're very different than adults. They're very different um, than adult sexual offenders. And because of that, our treatment should be developmentally appropriate. So for a while, what we saw happening in the field was that we would just have adult treatments um, for sexual offenders, and then we just use that for kiddos. So they have to be confronted and learn their cycles, but really that's not appropriate for children because they don't have cycles, right? Where you have to think about this behavior in a different way. When we're thinking about children, we're thinking about children who have broken rules, right? Children who have broken sexual behavior rules, um, but we're not talking about kiddos that have a deviant sexual behavior. Okay, so um, just to review, kind of to have some conclusions and go over some resources that we have for folks. 
Um, sexual behaviors of youth really do range from typical to concerning to problematic. It kind of went over um, what crosses that line, what are rare sexual behaviors that would be problematic that we wouldn't expect to see in kiddos, um, right? So anything with penetration, oral sex, insertion, things that have coercion, force, um, thinking about high frequency, um, longer duration, um, getting in the way of social development, right? All of these would be problematic. Um, thinking too, do they respond to treatment? If we see a problematic sexual behavior and we put a rule in place, no, that's not allowed. You're not allowed to enter their room while getting dressed. This is private time, right? Um, and that rule is followed, great, that's wonderful. If that rule continues to be broken and becomes a problem, that's when we might need to seek some intervention. Again, so thinking about the type of behavior and is it responsive to intervention? Um, there's no set profile or pattern of youth problematic, problematic sexual behavior. We talked about that there's a whole wide ranging set of origins. Sexual abuse is one of them, but not the only one. A lot of times there's that coercion that might be modeled, um, thinking about the family environment as well. We know that there is efficacious treatments out there. We know that they directly involve caregivers. Um, and there's a big focus on teaching about supervision, safety, and parenting skills, which is a huge piece. Um, and that treatment policies and practices should be based on facts rather than fears or myths about these kiddos. Okay, um, so with that, I wanted to provide some resources that kind of review and summarize a lot of the information, which I know is a lot that we've gone over in just the last hour together. Um, so the first one here is called What Happens Now? Uh, this is a really a resource for caregivers. Um, and you guys will be provided uh, through Caltrin with these resources. Um, so again, this first one is a resource for caregivers. Um, it kind of goes over, is there anything that I can do to help my child? Now that I know there's a problematic sexual behavior, have I done something wrong? It goes over the sexual behavior rules, which I highly recommend. There's about five um, sexual behavior rules. Um, that are really great, that really help um, kiddos. A lot of kiddos learn the sexual behavior rules and that's enough and that's great. Um, other kids might need a little bit more intervention. Um, and it goes over some safety planning that caregivers can engage in. So I see that Jess is dropping that in the chat now, which is great. Um, so that's the first resource. Um, the second resource um, is somewhat similar, but it's created for us, for professionals. Um, it's also created for child advocacy centers in particular. Um, so it goes over that continuum of sexual behavior from typical to problematic, right? Um, again, that force, that coercion, that harm, um, thinking about that normative to um, problematic kind of um, continuum. Um, and it also goes over a lot of what we discussed in this presentation in terms of um, treatment, effective treatments, things like that. So that resource is also available to you all. Two more resources I'm just gonna recommend. Um, one is an effective treatment fact sheet. So again, this can be helpful for ourselves, kind of like a cheat sheet for um, understanding what treatments um, or interventions our families might be involved in or if we're involved in them ourselves or if we're providing them. Um, it does go over best practices for PSB for, for treatment for youth. Um, and then this last one, it's a little old, but it's still very true. Um, I think it's from 2003. But it's a really, um, I think, neat fact sheet that's put out by the NCSBY, which I'll talk about in a second, which goes over the common misconceptions, right? Like all PSD happens in males, all kids have sexual abuse histories. It goes over these common misconceptions, and then it has a, a kind of a chart to go over the research to demystify them. Um, so Laura, um, I believe on the NCSBY, at NCSBY where these resources can be found that they might be available in Spanish? It's a really good question. I wish I looked that up before. Um, but hopefully Jess or someone at Caltrain can uh, help with that. And if we do find these resources in Spanish, we'll make sure to send them out as well. Thank you for that. Um, okay. So I mentioned that NCSBY, which stands for the National Center on Youth, for the National Center on the Sexual Behavior of Youth. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, the NCSBY is such a beautiful website, an amazing resource. It was developed in partnership with the folks at uh, the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center. Um, I really think it's a one-stop shop. It's got 
amazing resources for parents, amazing resources for professionals. It really walks you through what is the behavior? Is this problematic? Does it need intervention? Has a ton of resources, more than I can add to this presentation. But I highly recommend folks check, checking out this website. It's, it's a really um, kind of premier website um, when we're starting to think about understanding sexual behavior abuse. Um, I also recommend if you if you um, have not heard of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network or the NCTSN, um, they also have um, great information on here about um, fact sheets about um, kiddos with PSB. Um, and on all of these sites, you can also find information about adolescents as well. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, um, just that okay? Well, I can't, I guess I can't see folks anyway. So we're done a little bit early. Um, I know I kind of answered some questions, but I'd love to know if folks have other questions about this population or anything I presented on or anything that might be confusing. Um, if you can throw them up in the chat, I'd be happy to try my best to answer them. Or if you want to throw them up in the Q&A section, I'll be happy to answer them as well. I know it was a lot of information. Um, I hope this was a good introduction to uh, better understanding the population of children with problematic sexual behavior. So I'll give you guys a second. Um, best practices for keeping these students in public schools safely? Yeah, that's a great question, Patricia. Again, we really want to do everything we can to keep these kiddos engaged in normal social activities, right? We know that that is so powerful, um, having healthy peer relationships, um, having healthy mentors, um, seeing good social behaviors. We know that's so important and impactful. Um, you know, I would say... having some rules maybe for the school. So it depends. If the problematic sexual behavior happens at school um, and the school's aware of the problematic sexual behavior, we can have rules um, for that kiddo to follow, just like we would have any rules that that kiddo breaks. It's reinforced by the school and reinforced by the, by the caregiver. Um, so that positive reinforcement of rule following can be helpful. Um, I think what we see is that while kids are going through treatment. So if, again, if a kiddo is having problematic sexual behavior and they're not, they're not having any sort of intervention, we do wanna be very careful if those kiddos are continuing to be around other kiddos. We'd wanna see that they are in treatment and that they are um, receiving uh, supervision in the home, um, supervision within their activities. Again, at school, hopefully there's not too much time for kids to be alone with other kiddos. Um, so I guess the best practice would be that that kiddo is in an evidence-based treatment, um, and that's typically enough. Other questions? Okay. Um, let's see. Earlier you mentioned divided loyalties as a caregiver response. Um, can you elaborate a little on what that means? Absolutely, and how that can affect both the child with PSB and the other child and caregiver. Absolutely, so um, sometimes um, when I, I led a caregiver group um, for um, children with problematic sexual behavior, so I, I led the, the child group and, and led the, the caregiver group. Um, and sometimes what we see is that kiddos are engaging in problematic sexual behavior in the home with one of their siblings or a foster sibling. Um, so we have one kid, one kiddo that is engaged in problematic sexual behavior that needs intervention and needs that support. But then in the home, we also have a kiddo that might feel a lot of shame, maybe even needs intervention themselves, um, maybe has some trauma from that experience, um, right, that they need their own intervention. And so oftentimes we see families where one kiddo is in an intervention for problematic sexual behavior and the other is receiving some um, intervention for um, either trauma or that experience that um, made them feel uncomfortable, shame, fear, guilt. And so that can be really challenging for caregivers. Um, we're feeling divided loyalties, right? So maybe I've really connected to, I feel so bad for my kiddo that experience of problematic sexual behavior. But at the same time, I, you know, I have 
um, I don't want to ostracize my kiddo with trauma accepted behavior. So that can be really challenging to hold all of that as a caregiver, as you can imagine. And so caregivers really, really need support about how to deal with all that, how to manage all that. As you can imagine, it really upends the home environment. Um, so much supervision is needed, a lot is needed from them, a lot of resources and support. So it can be a really challenging time for caregivers when um, the problematic social behavior happens among siblings, and there's a lot of different emotions happening for both of um, their, their kiddos. Um, so I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, feel free to ask again. Um, would residential treatment be more effective if all kiddos in a milieu are receiving uh, treatment for STP, or is that too risky? It's a good question. I actually, um, my experience has only been, um, so I've worked in residential treatment facilities for youth um, with sexually reactive behavior, and that whole group, um, it was an entire group for that. Um, so that's really what I've seen um, in residential facilities. There might be other kinds of treatments that um, I'm not aware of, but to my knowledge, if there is an um, problematic sexual behavior or an illegal sexual behavior that does require residential treatment, typically it is a group of youth with that same behavior. And so they're in typically in group therapy, um, all learning together. Um, and in our treatments, um, in problematic sexual behavior, CBT, we do group treatment as well. Um, and what we find and what caregivers find is for caregivers, it's really helpful for there to be that normalization, that they're not the only ones, that their child has done this, they're not alone, that other caregivers have similar emotions, feelings, reactions. We also see that for kiddos, that they're not alone as well, that they're not this rare, strange thing over here that's bad, but that other kids have broke these rules as well. Um, and other kids have broken rules, have been through treatment, have been successful. Um, so we do tend to see group treatment for this population. Um, what is the range for similar ages between children? Such a good question. Um, so it does, chronologically, I would say probably within two to three years. And um, we also wanna take into de the developmental considerations too. So you might have a six-year-old and a five-year-old or a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. But if that eight-year-old is developmentally much, much younger, then we wanna take that into consideration as well. 12-year-old, 6-year-old, I would think, if they're, if we think about that chart, that would be problematic, um, right? There's that larger age gap, age gap, but I would say probably two years, two to three years. Um, okay, so I'm working with a kiddo, an 11-year-old, has been caught um, watching pornography at school. Mm -hmm. He told the teacher, uh, FaceTime to here, they both got naked and were touching themselves. What would be an appropriate intervention for parents, school, and social workers? Um, Amanda, thank you for that um, case example. Um, so looking at pornography in school is obviously breaking a rule. Um, so the treatment that I know the most about um, and the ones that I gave you a lot of resources on is um, problematic sexual CBT for PSD. So I apologize for all the acronyms, but cognitive behavior therapy um, for problematic sexual behavior. So again, an intervention for, for this example that would include rules about, um, um, I don't know if the behavior happened in private or public, um, it's hard for me to, to, to tell, um, definitely rules around um, looking at pornography, I don't know, I think that has to be a family rule, um, but definitely in private, not at public. Um, I would say I would look towards the um, resource that I gave around effective treatments um, for children with problematic sexual behavior. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with is that PSD CBT one, which is um, kind of group treatment for kids with problematic sexual behavior that does include their caregivers as well. I'm sorry, um, I tried to answer that one, Amanda. It's, it's hard not to know with more details. Um, what can be done? Um, if the child who has uh, child problematic sexual behavior runs away from parents who are seeking support and services, and there was um, soft seat, so I'm not, oh, okay. So I, I would need to know a little bit more. Um, I really appreciate the question. It's so hard for me to answer without knowing more. Um, so what I would say though to this is that what we're seeing is a lot of rule breaking too. We're seeing things like running away from parents. Um, so I would definitely um, suggest an intervention where caregivers are involved. Um, 
I'm not sure what grooming behavior means in this case. I think if a child is engaging in behaviors that are trying to get a child alone um, purposely so they can engage in problematic in sexual behavior, then that is problematic and that would require some um, level of intervention. Okay, I think those are them. I want to thank you on behalf of Keltrin again. We're just so grateful for your time and for your experience and your expertise. I want to thank the participants for your questions uh, and your engagement today. As um, Melissa mentioned, there are some incredibly valuable resources that she discussed today. They were dropped in the chat, but don't you worry, they will also be in the follow-up email. So with that, I want to say thank you all so much, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Dr. Melissa Bernstein. We're so grateful for you.